The history of a place is the interaction between people and the plants, animals, and natural phenomena that occur over time, from which traditions, stories, and ceremonies emanate. We value and are grateful for the local tribal knowledge shared for this slideshow. For this presentation, the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusla Indians, and the Kekwil Indian Tribe provided context to historically ascribed water bodies, place, plant, and animal names. The content and message communicated here about the natural areas surrounding the specific tidal marsh encompasses the language and place of the Miluk and Hanas peoples who lived, foraged, fished, and stewarded for future generations, the Coos Estuary. Hi, Jamie Faraday here, here from Coos Bay, and I'm a retired teacher from the school district here. I spent most of my career at the school next to this tidal marsh that you see in this image. I was uh, very much inspired to make access to it for use as teaching site and for community members to hike into. I'm a part of the stewardship group now and enjoy walking the trail as much as volunteering time and effort to maintain it for education and recreation. And I'm Marina Ritchie. I'm a natural history writer. I live in Bend. However, I have coastal connections that date back to attending the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology in the 1980s. And I recently served as the lead writer and planner for an award-winning series of 66 interpretive panels at 24 sites along the Oregon coast, a project for the Oregon Islands National Wildlife Refuge and the Oregon State Parks. I'm collaborating with Jamie and an artist, Ram Popish of Newport, on a new Millicoma Marsh interpretive trail that's part of a larger effort to bring more teachers and students to investigate both the fresh and the salt marsh ecology. In this webinar, Marina and I hope to inspire you to seek out your local places of wonder, whatever they are. What this is, is a place of immense productivity in life, providing so many ecological services that are largely underappreciated. We'll go over these benefits, how they have been lost and in some cases restored. Let's start with a little inspiration from Rachel Carson. To stand at the edge of the sea, to sense the ebb and flow of the tides, to feel the breath of a mist moving over a great salt marsh, to watch the flight of shorebirds that have swept up and down the surf lines of the continents for untold thousands of years, to see the running of the old eels and the young shad to the sea is to have knowledge of things that are as nearly eternal as any earthly life can be. And salt marshes are dynamic and flowing places, just like the shorebirds tracing their way across the open waters, the eelgrass beds, the brackish and freshwater marshes, and yes, salt marshes that are very sheltered and nourished. So what is a salt marsh? It's a coastal wetland grassy plain that's flooded by the tides with the lowest reaches blanketed twice daily. And you find them within sheltered estuaries and they feature the tidal channels and pools that you can see here. What you can't see are the deep muds and the peaty soils underneath the decaying plants. And you can't really tell that these are very salt adapted plants. This view is of Neetarts Bay salt marsh and you can see the wild dynamic marsh. And you can also note that there's an, a uh, straight line that does not look natural and that's the remnants of an old dike because these same level lowlands were considered desirable for early settlers to develop. And we'll hear more about that later. What we want you to come away with are several points that we'll go into later. Why salt marshes are so special. They are marine life nurseries, incubators and habitat, 
And they're doing this amazing work for us all the time, filtering pollutants, stabilizing the shoreline, buffering storms and flooding, and sequestering and storing large amounts of carbon. Salt marshes are integral to the traditions of four of the nine tribes in Oregon, as recognized by the federal government. Uh, tidal wetlands have been diked and drained for um, centuries globally and locally since the 1800s for building pasture land or buildable flat land for, for human habitation. 85% of the wetlands have been lost on the West Coast, 75% uh, for the Coos Estuary. Most all of Coos Bay salt marshes have been diked and drained. The images you see here, uh, the one on the right is of the South Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve. And on the left, uh, one of many sloughs east of downtown Coos Bay. They're both at high tide, but you'll notice that um, one is, has much more dry land um, because the, they have built, during low tide, dikes have been built along those tide channels that you can see uh, in the South Slough image. Uh, dike building often follows those, those channels and it's an easy way to reclaim land. And you'll also notice in the right hand image, there's uh, near the, the top third, there is a dike that has been broken and the tide has now reclaimed that back into a uh, tidal marsh. The good news is, is that uh, there is some revival in restoring wetlands. And this is a process of just reversing the diking and draining process, uh, reintroducing the tides into the wetlands, the, the former wetlands, and uh, letting nature basically take over and revive those areas back to their uh, hopefully original state. And here is Middle Oklahoma Marsh. This is taken from the trail, which is uh, up on a, on a large dike. You can see the image of the slope on the left. And that is uh, uh, the edge of a huge fill area, uh, diked material or dredge material from the bay has been placed on top of what used to be tidelands. And in 1972, uh, due to the Coastal Zone Management Act that was halted. Uh, no more wetlands were filled. Um, and so you can look at that as a, as a tide of land moving toward wetlands and being halted by the, an act of Congress. And here's a view um, just several feet up with a drone. And you can see to the left that edge of diked and, and uh, filled land and the Millicoma Marsh, tidal marsh in front of us. And the, the beautiful um, pattern of tidal channels. And there is a dike in the lower right hand corner out to the middle and that's the end of the Millicoma Marsh Trail. So we can access uh, the tides twice a day. There on the, the left side, you'll see the extent of the fill material that is about 15 to 20 feet thick and another trail that's going along, which is mostly port property and the tidal salt marsh in front of us. And the tidal channels connect to the bay, of course, bringing in the nutrients that make this place such a rich ecosystem. And the trail that leads down to the end uh, um, of the Milcombe Marsh Trail passes by two uh, sort of created wetlands. The, this big square thing in the middle is the city of Coos Bay's water, uh, wastewater treatment uh, facility for the sludge settling. And the one in the foreground is a freshwater pond that 
developed after the material, dredge material was dis deposited. And if we swing around facing west, you'll see the trail leading from this athletic field, Millicoma Middle School, Eastside Elementary, Coos Bay over here. But millions of cubic yards fill this tidal wetlands area in Eastside. Uh, but this one was saved, um, as I mentioned, due to the Coastal Zone Management Act. Now I want you to imagine tidal marsh all the way up to the uplands there, the treed area where there's residences here and all the way back to the school. Our pilot is about to land. One more look back toward the school. This area when I arrived was completely just grasses and it's grown up uh, with the help of willows and some planted evergreens along the way. There's one of the shelters in the trees. This is a wonderful place for environmental or outdoor education. Uh, if you have a school nearby and you can walk out the back door, that's, that's a perfect fit. Uh, and the first part of the Millicoma Marsh Trail traverses this um, fill area, which has been raised up about 15 to 20 feet above of tidal influence and now is developed as freshwater wetlands. And so, this serves as a rich contrasting life zones compared to the tidal marshes, which have uh, obviously salt, salt water. Uh, residents and visitors find playing and recreating in, in the estuary of value as others work there. Organizations like South Slough, uh, Coos Watershed, uh, Cape Arago Audubon, Bureau of Land Management, o Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and tribal nations involve themselves as part of their purposes. Uh, the trail affords uh, users many values. Uh, we hear back from people talking of the solitude, the, the birds, the wildlife, and it's so close to home and it's fully accessible to all ages. Millicoma's salt marsh, like all Oregon's salt marshes, have been stewarded by tribes. Since time immemorial, tribal people have sustainably fished gathered and managed culturally significant plants and traditional food plants growing in or adjacent to the marshes. Within local native culture, the water told the people where to live. Solid land with good access to deep water was sought for good village sites and salt marshes grew, stewarded for thousands of years for an abundance of resources such as sedges and rushes. Patricia Phillips, a Millic Coos tribal member, <laughs> describes Rushes in her book, Eth Ethnobotany of Coos, Loramqua, and Sayusla Indians. Rushes were used to make tump lines for pack baskets, rope for berry baskets, and carrying straps for baby cradles. They were also sometimes used along with cattail leaves in weaving women's hats and also in berry baskets with bear grass as an overlay. Rushes are still used today by the Coos Bay weavers, along with many other plants and are carefully harvested from different locations. The sedge used in weaving, off, often called sweetgrass, is American three square, found in the freshwater and saltwater marshes and along other waterways. Weavers choose a variety of plants for basket, basketry to add overlays and decorative material.
And as a teacher um, and a citizen, I, we are, uh, I try to help our young citizens learn those uh, activities that help their community. And here you see them uh, restoring some of the native species of plants along the, the marsh trail with, um, in, in lieu of the invasive species. Now I'm gonna take you a little bit on a, a journey, pretend you're walking along the marsh trail with us. And we're, this is a little preview of the new trail we're working on in terms of the, the self-guided interpretive signs. And we want people to think, to consider they're taking a journey that's both overland and underland. With every step, there's a buried salt marsh that's going to be closer to the surface. And the destination is the original tidal salt marsh, as you can see here. At the beginning of the trail is an entry kiosk, an existing one that has community billboards and student art and work and other notices. In the middle will be a brand new panel that will set the stage for what we hope all visitors will learn as they go forward on this experiential self-guided trail. The first sign will give people a chance to think about what it was like, where they were standing, where they're standing by that kiosk was once salt marsh. They might've been in rubber boots or in a tidal channel right there. And this idea that in this picture on the left, you can see an old picture, you can see a bit of how the marsh used to be in 1910. And then in the 1850s is actually when the European settlers started diking, draining and filling the Coos estuary. Um, and then 1989, you can see how bare it all looks. This athletic field is what you cross over to get to that kiosk area at the beginning. And that's after decades of dumping dredged sand, silt and mud, and it had just mostly non-native grasses. The difference now is unbelievable when you come to Millicoma Marsh, the freshwater marsh of today that you start walking through, that was once salt marsh, is really a tribute to the volunteers and the students and teachers like Jamie who are planting the trees and the groups like Audubon who are creating the slopes, ponds and channels and others to help this become a wildlife mecca and nature really did the rest. The Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua and Sayusla Indians are made up of three tribes, four bands, two bands of Coos tribes, Hanis Coos, Millet Coos, Lower Umpqua tribe, and Sayusla tribe. The Coos tribe lived on the Southwest Oregon Pacific coast. The two Coos communities were deeply intertwined. The Hanis lived on the upper and mid bay, Millet on and near the South Slough. The Millic had fish camps on South Fork. The Hannes had seasonal fish camps on the river from the mouth to the forks and on the North Fork, the modern Millicoma. Native lands were taken without payment, contrary to the law. Despite having their lands taken from them, the local tribes still see themselves as stewards of their lands and waters where their ancestors lived for thousands of years. They are involved up and down the coast with restoration efforts, many including salt marshes for their valued weaving materials, as well as being fish habitat and filtering systems. The tribes recognize that water is life. If you don't have water, you have nothing. And that is a quote from Chief Doc Slider of the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua and Sayusla Indians. The Hanis had a, their largest empire village, Hanislich, was a fish camp at a place not too far away and upstream from Millicoma Marsh. The Millic speaking Bay villages had their fish camps on the South Fork Coos River. The new trail does not yet have our peer posts in. And that's what we're going to do is rather than use a traditional square sign that kind of doesn't really fit with the landscape. We thought, why not make the signs look like posts 
an, uh, something that would fit in a marine scene. And so the sign on the right, the pier post is, the, is an example of what ours will be like, except ours will be better because we'll have these nature plant prints that students are working on. And so along the way, the messages will be appear as these stacked tiles on this freshwater to saltwater trail of discovery. Here are three of the draft tiles for our planned interpretive signs featuring a beaver, swallows and bats, and tree frogs. We plan to incorporate Hannes and Millic words, as you can see on this slide. About 33 years ago, I started my teaching post at Millicoma Middle School. And as a biology student myself, was astonished to see what was available out the back door. Field experiences are key to learning life sciences, and we were 10 minutes by foot to the tides of the estuary. But the last step was through a dense curtain of Himalayan blackberry, and that's where uh, federal funds came in to build the trail to the salt marsh. And 10 minutes later, you could get to this uh, tidal channel of the salt marsh. Uh, this is a place of calm waters and lots of organic material coming down from the Coos River and from the ocean, uh, twice a day tides. Uh, in this rich sediment, mud burrowing creatures exploit this near inexhaustible supply of nutrients. These, food, these are food for predatory animals, mostly fish and birds. Uh, and the salt marsh channels provide food, shelter, and, and tranquil place for young fish to uh, rest and grow, especially those who, like salmon, must acclimate to fresh and saltwater environments. As Marina already mentioned, uh, these are places where um, many values exist. Um, the tides of the ocean and the flow of the river and a twice, a, twice a day ebb and flood bring nutrients to the plants and animals and taking away waste products. These are truly nurseries and incubators. The productivity of salt marshes rivals or surpasses that of our richest corn or wheat fields, supplying food for worms, oysters, clams, crab, shrimp, fish, birds, and mammals, us included. Roughly 80 to 90% of commercial fish species depend on estuaries at some point in their life cycle. These are also huge uh, filters. The, the wide reaches of tide flats are natural for trapping and capturing not only nutrients, but also any toxins or pathogens can be neutralized biologically here. Floodwaters from extensive rain and storm events are better stabilized when there are areas to spread out and keep shorelines to uplands more stable. And last but not least, um, these tidelands, especially marshes, accrue and hold large amounts of carbon. When they are drained and dried, the carbon stores are released into the atmosphere. Restoring wetlands reverses this trend. Stay tuned for a video later in this show, an up close look at carbon in a marsh, referred to as blue carbon. What I'd like you to think of now and imagine is that you're a coho salmon hatched out in the gravel bed way up the west fork of the Millicoma River, which is a tributary to the Coos. Your yolk sac sustains you for four months when you emerge to feed off of plankton nearby. And after about 18 months, you head downstream toward the ocean and get your first taste of brackish water during high tide in the estuary. You're about four inches long and schooling with other coho, but are vulnerable to predation in the open bay water. So you seek a shallow set of tide channels that are easy to navigate and full of tasty crustaceans. Next move is to the ocean in about five months. But for now, you find sanctuary in the marsh channels, eating, resting, and growing. Sound like a nursery? To reiterate Rachel Carson, what if that place was not there? What if I had never seen this before? The nursery 
artwork you just saw that Jamie told you about the coho salmon journey is another little tile that's going to appear out at the end of the marsh interpretive trail where people are looking out and having this spectacular view of the last best salt marsh and also we'll invite people to walk down and into the marsh itself and have a, a post down at that edge and feature the adaptations of plants to salt. Seawater is a real challenge, but the salt marsh plants have triumphed through evolution. They had to overcome these things. One, how to absorb water from a saline solution. Two, how to maintain internal salt levels within comfortable limits. And three, how to absorb enough nutrients that they must have from a solution so rich in toxic salts. So they figure out a way to exclude what's bad and attracts what's good through complex chemical mechanisms and they still have to get rid of the unwanted salt with special organs called salt glands that are found on the leaves and stems of most salt tolerant plants. Like in salt bush, the glands are tiny hairs that swell with salt and then burst, leaving white deposits on the leaves of the salt bush and salt grass. Another strategy is the one you're seeing here with pickleweed. So you can read about it here and it's uh, that they, to live here, this crafty plant removes salt and stores brine in special chambers at its tips. When full, the segments turn red and drop off. So walk out into the marsh and find pickleweeds and other plants. And we want people to also think about stopping for kayaks as they go on. But there's a problem for that little mouse that was in the slide with the pickleweed because Above is the wind bird, the white-tailed kite will be coming out and hunting over the marsh. Northern harriers too are swooping low because they can find uh, pretty tasty rodents among those salty grasses. And the white-tailed kite is particularly spectacular and we're very lucky to have this bird along the coast of Oregon. Uh, you may have seen the kite way fluttering high above a field in our salt marsh and this distinctive behavior facing into the wind like that and the beautiful white wings is called kiting as if the bird were attached by an invisible string. So this is a, a wonderful place for viewing raptors. It's also a place to listen for some very well adapted birds that you are not going to see often, like the Virginia rail. And you think about adaptations, look at the size of the toes. Those long toes are give the Virginia rail the ability to actually walk on floating mats. And we have this sign and it will appear at a place where it's a, you can have freshwater marsh on one side and then the wild salt marsh on the other. And indeed the rail can go back and forth between the two. Um, and you might listen for these knick knick or kind of wonk, 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 these very pig-like grunts that make the sound, that's the Virginia rail. And there's something else that's secretive, something that you have to dig deep to find out about. I think Maureen is referring to blue carbon that is deep in the soils of tidal wetlands and many wetlands. And this infographic uh, talks about the, the ability of tidal land wet, and wetlands and seagrass beds uh, to capture and store CO2 and other greenhouse gases. The middle section goes over how, um, how they rate compared to forests, for instance. And they are uh, acre per acre much greater in holding carbon. And in the bottom uh, is a rate of loss, in, at least in the US. And uh, perhaps um, that's why we're, we're going this direction so that we can think about how to reverse that. We're going to hear now from Craig Cornu, who is a former uh, employee as the stewardship coordinator at South SLU and is now with uh, an Institute of Applied Ecology about salt marshes. Tidal wetlands provide a whole series of, of functions or ecosystem services to plants, animals, humans 
Uh, and one of those functions is uh, the storage of carbon in um, tidal wetland soils. Okay, what is blue carbon? This is blue carbon. So what I'm holding here is the organic material that gets buried in salt marshes. Uh, it's hard to tell at this time of year, but this is marsh surface here. This is the soil, and you have organic material that's, that's buried, and this goes down very, very deep. So there's quite a bit of, of organic material here. If tidal wetlands around here in the Pacific Northwest are functioning normally on a per area basis, they store uh, a lot more carbon for a lot longer than a forest ecosystem, for example. When tidal wetlands are converted to ag lands, the typical scenario is to dike the edge of the wetland and eliminate the tide from from that that uh, tidal marsh and to dry it out organic stores the carbon stocks in those um, tidal wetlands are lost and they're um, they're lost to uh, to the air they they uh, decompose over time tidal wetlands have been restored for about the past 30 plus years in the Pacific Northwest and typically a wetland restoration project here um, and also elsewhere um, consists of taking a converted tidal wetland, uh, tidal wetland that was converted to, to ag land, for example, um, and reversing the process of diking and draining by uh, removing the dike um, and re, re, reintroducing uh, the tide to those to those lands, and it's amazing how quickly um, tidal wetlands can come back. Uh, in about five, ten years, uh, you can have a pretty well-functioning um, tidal wetland. The two biggest restorations that I know of in in Oregon. Um, are ones in, in Bandon at the Nyleston um, Restoration Project. Um, in Tillamook, uh, uh, there's the Southern Flow Corridor Project, which is even bigger than that. And I won't. More locally, um, South Slough Reserve ha it, uh, has done a series of tidal wetland uh, projects. Primarily in uh, one project, we were um, wanting to know if we could use dike material to correct the, um, the marsh elevation uh, because a lot of these, um, uh, if not most of these, um, converted tidal wetlands actually subside o over, over time. And uh, we wanted to, to know at what elevation should we reestablish the, uh, the marsh surface um, and we determined uh, that there's a middle ground that works for, for various reasons. Well, now that you've got a, you've joined uh, a bit of a salt marsh expedition virtually, we hope that you will go out yourselves and find an estuary, find a salt marsh, and think about the tides, the time of the tides when you go out and always the season and visit often. This is a photo that Jamie took uh, recently of the king tide at Millicoma Marsh. So there's a lot of water. Just think how those plants had to adapt to all that salt and imagine what might be swimming below the surface. And as the ocean brings in these high tides, there's more sediment deposited and building over time these incredibly important and productive salt marshes. You come at low tide, it's a totally different experience, just as it is by season when things are growing. And as uh, we've 
pointed out before, this is a time to look at these incredible patterns of tidal channels and to go out in your rubber boots and stomp around and, and take a closer look, maybe taste a pickle weed. And we feel at this point, we've been barely skimming the surface. So that's why we invite you to delve deeper into salt marshes, both in the field and perhaps pick up a book, especially this one, The Northwest Coast and Natural History by Stuart Schultz. It's just full of incredibly important and interesting and readable material all about the ecology along the coastal shores. And I was thinking about, well, how best to wrap this up. And I returned to a journal, 150 pages plus, that I wrote in my coastal biology class many years ago at Oregon Institute of Marine Biology under the professor, Jerry Rudy. And I looked at it again and I thought, you know, the last couple sentences I wrote in this chapter on estuaries are pretty appropriate. So I'm going to read what I wrote many years ago to end this show for you. The importance of the estuarine ecosystem is far reaching, caring for the health of the estuary by preserving salt marshes, eelgrass beds, mud flats, and pollution free waters is caring for the ocean resource and the continuation of our own species. Thank you.